Hey guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. Some boas, of course, are more popular than others. And if you've been following the boa hobby for any period of time, you've doubtlessly observed that some boas get more popular over time, some get less popular over time. So today I'm going to talk about a few underrated boas, which I believe, although not getting much attention now, really deserve a lot more attention and should be a lot more popular. I'm going to talk about some boas that used to not be popular but are now super popular like this one. And I'm going to talk about some that are kind of getting more popular uh, and getting some of the attention they long have deserved. And then I'm also going to talk about what I call cult classics, types of boas that have a very dedicated, loyal following, although they're not the more popular or visible types of boas. They're the dedicated group of hobbyists that really love them. So be sure to stay tuned for that. If you're new to the reptile hobby, you may have been looking over the online classified sites just to see what types of boas are available. And you may be a little perplexed when it comes to the pricing because sometimes it seems like certain boas are just a lot more expensive than others. I'm not even talking about the morph boas. Obviously, if a, there's a new gene, it's going to be expensive. I'm talking about the locality boas. And so sometimes it comes down to some boas are harder to breed than others and, you know, leading to less of a supply. But a lot of it just has to do with individual desirability. And so people just like certain boas better than others at different times, but it's always changing. And so an obvious example are the true red tails. These have always had a cult class, cult following where people just think that they're the epitome of the boa constrictor. So true red tails are priced higher. In addition, they tend to be harder to breed than common boas and other types of boas. But sometimes it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so, Often, you know, it just comes down to supply and demand. If there's less of a demand, even though there might be a lower supply, it's just not going to be as popular of a boa. And I think one example of that are these Pearl Island boas like this one. And so, unfortunately, this guy's in shed. Um, seems like both my adults, or all three of my adults, are in shed right now for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just wanted to get him out and his colors are normally quite a bit brighter than this. He's a real nice golden brown color. But the Pearl Island boa is a little bit different than most other boas. I would say it's probably the most divergent um, of the locality boa group that I've seen anyway. One obvious difference is that they're much more elongated than most boas. They're longer and skinnier. They're built for life in the trees. And the shape of the head is also quite unusual. They have this long wedge-shaped head with flared nostrils and then these really big prominent eyes. Really a cool looking boa. And so these guys are so different that when they were first described by science around 100 or so years ago, they were in a separate genus, the genus Epicrides, along with the uh, rainbow boas, Epicrides subogae. But they were reclassified as a subspecies of boa constrictor back around the mid 20th century, boa constrictor subogae. And then depending on which classification you believe, with boa imperator elevated to a full species, these would likely fall as a subspecies of boa imperator, boa imperator subogae. But personally, they don't care what you call them. You know, this is just for the humans, not for the snakes. So these animals became available in herpeticulture relatively recently, back in the early 2000s. And when they first became available, they were really expensive, you know, in the several thousands of dollars range. And so there was a limited supply, but they just never really took off, you know, as far as some of the other types of boas. And I think people think they're aggressive, which they can be a little nippy, but mine are really fine. They haven't bit me at all, and they're no problem at all to handle. Uh, another difference is behaviorally, they move around more. They're more active than most boas, more like a colubrid. So maybe that was uh, a turnoff for some people. But I really like them, and I really think that they're interesting and very diverse as far as their looks and behavior. And they really fit nicely into a locality boa collection. You know, just all these different variations on the theme of what a boa constrictor is in nature. And, you know, I love evolutionary biology, and the locality boas are about as perfect of a textbook example of evolution as I can think of. So these animals have relatively small litters. In fact, this guy just uh, sired a litter that was born 
uh, about a month and a half ago when my earliest litter ever by the way and my first for this year they have small litters it was only five babies um, you know I think that contributes to the low supply you know why there's not more of a demand I don't really know because these are really cool boas I think they just maybe haven't gotten enough a publicity as some of the other types of locality boas have gotten but this is one I could definitely see could uh, increase in popularity over time and then because of the low reproductive capacity and the small amount of animals in captivity in the US and the small breeding population I could definitely see these guys getting more expensive and hard to get another type of boa that obviously is underrated right now and deserves a lot more popularity is actually a group of boas united by their geographic origin and that's the Central American mainland boas and I actually don't have a lot or really any Central American mainland boas I have a lot of Central American island boas like this Honduran firebelly boa um, so I can't show you one of the Central American island boas or mainland boas rather there's actually a little bit of controversy around the origins of these firebelly boas some say they're from the island of Roatan uh, a barrier island of Honduras others claim that they're mainland Honduran boas you know since their appearance overall is pretty similar to the mainland Honduran boas I thought I'd grab this guy as uh, you know for you to look at while I'm talking and as luck would have it he's in shed so his colors are kind of muted you know his belly is normally a lot brighter than this this guy is actually one of the nicest holdbacks I've ever produced of any type of boa uh, but Regardless, getting back to the Central American mainland boas, there are quite a few different forms in the hobby from mainland Belize boas to Nicaraguan to uh, Costa Rican to Panamanian boas. And they're um, in general have really attractive patterns. They may not be quite as brightly colored as the true red tails, but they're definitely beautiful in their own way. Their size is a little bit smaller than most boas. You're looking at a boa probably in the five to six foot range as an adult, so they're convenient to keep because of their size. Um, they have a reputation, especially in some of the older books, as being more aggressive and more hissy than the Colombian uh, boas, but, you know, the Colombian pet store type boa imperator, so that's maybe something that they have against them. But um, I haven't really found that with you know, any of these Central American island boas I've kept. So, you know, I think that these Central American boas deserve a lot more popularity. If I had more space in my collection, I would definitely pick up, you know, three or four different types, because it is the one gap I have in my collection as far as types of locality boas not represented. You know, but being that I'm pretty much out of space and bandwidth, I don't think it's gonna happen, unfortunately. Uh, but the Central American mainland boas are really undervalued. I think some of them are probably the least expensive you can get any boa for. I've seen some boas as little as like $69, $79 lately. So they're definitely less expensive than some of the other boas in the pet trade. And there's even Central American specific morphs like a T-positive albino and anerythristic. People are making combos with them. You know, so a lot of opportunity to get into either locality or more specific uh, Central American boas. For whatever reason, they're just not as popular. So we'll just have to see if they go up in popularity, but I think that they definitely deserve more popularity, the Central American mainland boas. Now that we've seen a couple types of locality boas that I think deserve more popularity and should become more popular with time, I'd like to talk about a couple that are now super popular, but they used to not be so popular. And the poster child in this group is the Argentine boa like this one. So these guys are now one of the hottest boas the last few years. They've just been crazy popular. The prices have just shot through the roof and the supply is very small. So uh, these guys are a great boa. I've always loved these guys. They've always been one of my top favorite. My first boa that I bred back in 2005 was an Argentine boa. Um, and I've just always been really attracted to them. You know, I've kept them since the late 90s. And some of my stock today are descended from my original ones, my original pair that I got back in the late 90s. And these guys, for a very long time, they were somewhere in the $100 to $150 to $200 range, back around, you know, the 
early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, up until, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, they were relatively affordable. And so these guys have got, kind of gotten a bad reputation. There have been a lot of books which have erroneously claimed that they're aggressive or that they bite or things like that, which is completely untrue. They might be a little bit more hissy, especially as babies, but they're not aggressive at all. Um, I guess maybe some people originally didn't like them because they were dark in coloration and people liked the more brightly colored boas like the true red tails but you just can't beat the looks of these guys they're just gorgeous gorgeous animals with their dark coloration and their reticular pattern and they're also a really interesting boa as far as their behaviors um, they're from a you know much farther south location than most boas and they're used to more temperate climates in argentina and, and you know southern south america and i quite extreme southern south america more like central south america south of uh, you know, the amazon and the tropical regions but they're more hardy because of this they tend to be um, less temperamental certainly than the true red tails just a great species to work with so i remember back i my first couple of litters of boas i had were in 05 and 07 and they were both argentine boas and at the time there was no facebook or youtube or you know the online classifieds and I ended up actually selling them on Craigslist because I you know, just had a small group of boas back then. I wasn't really connected to the community. And I think I sold them for like 125 on Craigslist of all places. Um, and even then they were kind of hard to sell. I don't know why people just didn't like them back then. I think when they first became available back in like the late 80s, early 90s, you know, there was a original export of these animals to the United States before they were listed as a CITES category one, which banned all export. And a small group became available, was imported to the US by Eugene Bissett and some other hobbyists. And you know, all of the animals in captivity in the US are descended from that group. But originally when they first came out, they were like, I don't know, around $500. I remember seeing a price list in 92, when I was still in high school, that was for $500 a piece for these Argentine boas. But then the price went down. And I think when I picked my pair up, my original pair back in the late 90s, they were, I, I don't know, 150, 175 or so. And again, that's 1990s dollars, which that would probably be equivalent to like five or six hundred dollars in you know today's inflated currency. Um, but anyway, the price after that just seemed to kind of go down for quite a while. And I tried to, I had a, my small group and I ended up trying to add a pair and I was able to find a pair back in I think 2018 or 2019. This is actually a 2018 female from the pair. And at the time, they were $400 each, you know, $800 for the pair, which I was like, oh my God, that's a lot of money. But unfortunately, now the going rate is about double that. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people selling them for like a thousand bucks a piece. So, you know, we'll see if the um, market can sustain that or if they continue to go higher. I mean, so far, it seems like the demand for these beauties far outweighs the supply. And there's not a lot of them around. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see where the price goes, but beautiful uh, boa, it deserves its popularity. I, I, I'm not going to say it's underrated anymore because it clearly isn't, but for a long time, the Argentine boa was definitely an underrated boa. And so the next main boa that was once underrated that is now super popular, I actually don't have any of, and they're technically not a boa constrictor. They're in the boa family. They look like boa constrictors a lot. They act like boa constrictors. And that, of course, is the Doomerals boa. And this is a great species of boa from Madagascar, one of the few boas that lives outside of the Americas. And as I mentioned, in terms of its appearance and habits and uh, captive husbandry, it's pretty similar to a boa constrictor. Um, so these animals, similar to the Argentines, way back when they first became available, they were quite expensive. I remember this price list from the early 90s back when I was still in high school and that was the one that had the Argentine boas for 500. Dumeril's boas were listed on that same price list for 400. Um, I think it might have been Peter Calls. I'm not exactly sure. I wish I had saved all of my old herp literature but I don't have that anymore. But anyway these animals were um, expensive when they first came out but then towards like the late 90s early 2000s they kind of crashed in price and it's not 
quite clear why, because they are beautiful looking animals. The husbandry is said to be pretty straightforward. Uh, interesting species, very impressive to look at. You know, so a great species to keep, Dumeril's bows. And I'm always asked, why, do you, why don't you keep Dumeril's? What's your opinion of Dumeril's? And the main reason is there's just so many great reptiles to keep, I can't keep them all. But you know, if I wasn't keeping a reptile, I would definitely think about getting a Dumeril's. And so the price went down, and I remember I was at a pet shop in San Jose, California around 2009-ish, 2010. And I remember seeing Doom Rolls available, and they were $125 a piece. And I could have just picked it up, picked one up right there, and it got out my credit card. Don't have to worry about shipping. Um, I, th I really thought about it, but I, I actually opted not to get those Doom Rolls. But then the price just started going up a few years ago. And I think a lot of it has to do with YouTube, and certain creators made videos about Doom Rolls. And, got the message out there how cool they were and they became super popular now as far as I know the price is not quite as high as the Argentines but it's somewhere in that six to eight hundred dollar range and so again we'll see if the market can support that price so far the demand far outweighs the supply so I wouldn't think that the price is gonna go down anytime soon we'll just have to see if it continues to climb but the Argentine and the Dumeril's Boas are two once uh, highly overlooked and highly underrated species that are now among the most popular boas available. Next I'm going to explore a couple boas that were once not at all popular but lately have becoming very popular and I would say are on their way to being among the most popular of the locality boas. And so the first is this guy. This is a Tower Humara mountain boa from northern Mexico and these guys are arguably the smallest of the boa constrictor group this guy is a five-year-old male and he's just under four feet in length and he's not going to get much bigger at all. In fact, this guy hopefully is a father-to-be. So we'll see in a few months, hopefully his lady will be bearing some uh, of his babies. But we'll just have to see. But these guys, I've always loved them. It's just so cool to have a boa constrictor that's no bigger than a corn snake or ball python. And they have all of the interesting boa constrictor behaviors and a much more manageable pint size package. And I think people originally, when they were not super popular, people just saw them as dark boas. People in general didn't like boas from Mexico for whatever reason, because they were considered dark and not very colorful. And also had a reputation for being aggressive, which uh, uh, is completely undeserved. They do hiss more than some other types of boas but it's really just a bluff and they I don't think I've ever been bitten uh, by a Tarahumara boa. I've been struck at by the little babies but they're so tiny they can't do any damage anyway it's actually quite comical but my adults are really quite mellow. And So going back about 10 or 12 years these animals were relatively easy to get and relatively inexpensive you know the going rate seemed to be somewhere between two and three hundred dollars a piece back then when I first got my animals and um, it seems like they were it was pretty easy to get them too they were you know there's quite a bit of, quite a good supply of them but then it seems like the last few years they just haven't been available and actually I haven't had a litter in the last couple of years you know my male my older male for whatever reason just you know isn't breeding well anymore but this year I hope to have a litter. This is a younger male that I'm using for the first time uh, with a younger female, so we'll f fingers crossed on a litter. Um, but it seems like people have been reaching out to me a lot lately, like in the last year or two, just super interested in these Tara Humara boas. And unfortunately, I don't know anybody that has them. And in fact, one of my buddies who's a breeder really wanted a male to add to his breeding group, and he came to me, you know, asking if I had any. I said, No, sorry, I don't. Uh, but finally he managed to track down a male, not an adult, but kind of a sub-adult male from a well-known breeder. Um, you know, he told me the price and I was, my, my jaw dropped. I'm not going to tell you the price or who the breeder was, but these guys apparently have gone up a lot in value in the last few years just because the supply is, you know, virtually non-existent and there's a lot of demand out there. Um, I think they, de they deserve the popularity. You know, we'll have to see where the price goes in the next few years. You know, maybe if more people get into them, there'll be a, a larger amount available and more people can keep them, which would be great. 
you know so it's it's in everyone's best interest for there to be a lot of these boas available so whoever wants them doesn't have to pay an arm and a leg to get them and we can all enjoy these fascinating animals but we'll just have to see where that goes but great dwarf boa from northern mexico the tarjumara mountain boa um, can't recommend it enough this next locality boa that's becoming more popular the last few years has a lot in common with the Tarahumara Mountain Dwarf Boa, and that's the Kral Ki Boa, another dwarf form of locality boa. And other than the Tarahumara Mountain Boa, these guys are probably the smallest locality boa available today. This is a female who's five years old, and she's maybe about four feet long. Her mother is actually a little bit longer. She's about five, five and a half feet, but she's by far my largest uh, key boa. And these animals, similar to the Tarhumar, they were just overlooked for a long time. People just weren't interested in these dwarf Central American island boas. Even though they're some of the most interesting from an evolutionary perspective, they're convenient to keep because of their small size. They're really beautiful to look at and they're just really enjoyable to handle. Something about having a little mini boa constrictor is just uh, you know, a great experience. And so, similar to the Tarahumara I just showed you, this is the female born here in 2017. And in fact, back when I had the litter of these and my Tarahumara in 2017, they just weren't selling. And I think at the time I had them priced at like $250, $250 a piece, um, which seemed to be the going rate, but they just weren't very popular. And in fact, the reason why I held these guys back is because they didn't sell and I figured I'll just hold them. They're kind of neat and they don't take up much space and you know, I'm really glad I held on to them. So this particular female isn't in breeding trials this year. She's still a little on the small side, but next year she'll probably be in breeding trials. Her mother is gravid right now. I'm almost positive she's gravid. So with any luck, we'll have a nice litter of these crawl key boas in the summer, probably in late July, early August. So stay tuned for that. Um, but another great species that deserves the revival and popularity and we'll just have to see if the supply stays low and if the um, demand stays high and where the popularity of these goes in the future the crocky dwarf boa the last group of boas i'm going to talk about in today's video about boa popularity are those that i feel have a cult following so these are not the most well-known boas if you go on the forums or the facebook groups or the classifieds you probably aren't going to hear that much about them at least not in the general forums and you may not have even heard of these boas if you're relatively new to the world of locality boas but these are boas that have a very dedicated group of following of people who are just super passionate about them. A lot of people will specialize in these boas and try to have a very diverse collection of different bloodlines. Uh, they're just, uh, they've always been not super popular with the mainstream hobby, but super popular with a small group of very dedicated followers. And so the first of these is the long tail boa, or the longicata boa, like this one. And these are a beautiful dark boa that gets darker with each shed. This guy is a young adult who's assumed his adult coloration. But when these guys are babies and sub-adults, they're nowhere near as dark. So you, one of the boas that you cannot judge the appearance of the adults from how the babies look. They're also known for their beautiful dark markings on their heads. And they have a kind of a small size, not quite a dwarf, but maybe like a semi-dwarf boa. This guy is maybe five feet long. And so this guy just came out of breeding trials. I think he will hopefully have his first litter on the ground in another month or two. Uh, this is a uh, Rio Bravo bloodline that's supposedly had for anerythristic. So with any luck, I'll have some anerythristic babies as well. Looking at the the normal wild type form, you can see it's kind of on the anerythristic spectrum. You know, kind of a dark bow and not much red or yellow coloration. But you can see looking at the background color, there's a little bit of a yellowish tannish tint to it. These anerythristic ones don't have that same yellowish tint. They're just really black and white looking, almost uh, like a black and white photograph. And so these boas are popular, they're not just because they're beautiful to look at, but they're really easy to keep, relatively hardy, simple, you know, they seem to be relatively easy to breed, at least for me so far. Um, and just an enjoyable boa to take out and handle. So they have a well-deserved cult following. 
there are several groups on Facebook dedicated to these Longicata, and I think people that keep them feel really passionate about the Longicata, and they're just, you know, their favorite types of boas. The last boa for today's video is another cult favorite with a small group of very dedicated followers, and that is the Amarale boa, also known as the short tail boa, or the Bolivian boa. There are Amarale also from South Brazil, but it's a type of boa that's farther south than most other locality boas, with the exception of the Argentine boa, Occidentalis. And this animal is a Joe Terry bloodline called the Orange Crush bloodline, and it's known for its orangey, lavender, purplish colors. This guy is particularly colorful. And people love these uh, Amarale boas because they're just so distinctive. They're the kind of the thickest, stockiest boa. They're not quite as thick and stocky as a ball python, but kind of in that direction. They have these short heads with these kind of big cheek muscles, big jaw muscles, kind of like a pit bull almost. But they're super laid back in personality, really enjoyable to handle. They're said by many to be the most intelligent type of boa and seem to recognize the handler. Like when I open up their enclosure, he kind of looks up at me almost like he's expecting me. It's just a really super cool boa. So these guys, much like the long tail boa, have a dedicated following. And a lot of people who have these, these are their favorites and they really swear by these. Um, unfortunately, they're kind of hard to get right now. The price has kind of gone up over the last few years. But I don't see these guys being ever quite as popular as say the true red tails or you know, some of the more popular morph boas. But I also don't see them ever not being popular. They're just kind of a cult following and the people who love them are just gonna continue to keep them um, you know, as long as boa keeping is around. And so these are another form that you might not have heard of if you're just new to boas um, because they're not gonna be as prominent in the boa groups at least the general purpose boa groups, or on the uh, reptile classifieds. But both this and the long tail boa are definitely great boas to keep if you want something that's a little bit different. And you may even en end up joining the cult of these followers of these animals and keeping nothing else. So great boa to keep, the Bolivian boa, boa constrictor, and morali. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, gave you some food for thought about boa popularity and how trends change over time with some boas becoming more or less popular. We'll have to see where the market goes and what boa is gonna be the most popular to keep five or 10 years down the road. I'm sure I missed out on some underrated boas, so if you have a boa you think is underrated that deserves more popularity and more exposure, please comment below. And in fact, I'll try to do my best to make a video on that boa if I can and if I have the expertise in the future, just so hopefully we can bring more awareness to these underrated boas. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.